Welcome back to the channel. I'm Kerry Arms, one of the owners of CSS, and in part two of this build video, I'm gonna walk you through all the technical details of how I built this speaker. I'm gonna be honest. I almost threw in the towel several times on this build. You know what? And not for the reasons that I thought it was gonna be. Building the cabinets actually turned out to be quite a bit easier than I anticipated. Um, you know, it was a long process and it, it definitely took some time and it was a lot of work, but I didn't run into any major challenges while doing those. Uh, but once I started to get into crossover development and uh, some finishing touches on this cabinet, I just kept running into problem after problem. It ended up dragging out finishing this project uh, for a lot longer than I thought it was going to. I'm also not ashamed to say that I had several Nick Cage style meltdowns over the course of wrapping these crossovers up ah, 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 for various reasons, which we'll get into over the course of the video. I like to start all my projects with a box model since that's going to ultimately determine how big the cabinet needs to be. Since I've already used this woofer several times before, I already know that it likes about three quarters of a cubic foot of volume. That volume will get the woofer down to about 30 hertz anechoic. And so since I'm using six of these woofers, I'm just going to multiply that by six. And that gives me four and a half cubic feet. At four and a half cubic feet, the cabinet is going to be pretty big. Uh, and I knew it was going to be hard to move the, the cabinet around in our facility and especially to move it upstairs to our listening room if I built it as a single unit. So I decided to split it into three pieces. So each base section uh, will be three woofers and there'll be two base sections per cabinet and then there'll be a separate section that houses the mid. The plan was to put the crossover in the back of the mid box and then be able to connect all of these boxes up together. My plan was to use a three inch port and if you look at how we would normally tune this around 32 hertz with the three inch port, uh, we get a very flat response uh, with a port length of about 14.1 centimeters. Now a couple of the other things that I'm going to look at when I do a box model like this is the vent velocity at different power levels as well as the driver excursion. So while this leads to the flattest response, I ended up tuning just a little bit lower which makes a slightly shallower roll off. It will give you a higher F3 but a lower F10. Uh, but the reason I chose to do this is because it's going to push the peak in the vent velocity down very low in frequency. The vent is slightly undersized for this application, but because the tuning frequency is so low and there's very little musical content down there, my experience has been when the peak in the vent velocity is pushed much lower in frequency, it tends to be really hard to actually have chuffing in, in a normal musical passage. One other thing to note here is that I'm modeling only three drivers in a single portion of the enclosure. This is because I need to make sure that the port is sized for that portion of the enclosure. If I did all six drivers in the same enclosure, my enclosure is going to be much bigger and then the port dimensions are going to be different. I covered the whole cabinet build in the last video and this is the design I came up with. I wanted to make sure that the cabinet had some angles to it so that it wasn't just a boring rectangle. So now we're going to jump right into the measurements. I might be screwed. Whoa, calm down, Nick. This might still be salvageable. So while the tweeter response looked okay on its own, it doesn't really have much overlap with the mid. Generally, I'm going to be looking for at least two octaves of usable overlap between the two drivers, but as you can see in the highlighted portion here, I don't really have that. The mid basically falls off a cliff around 1.6K. Now, this isn't necessarily the end of the world, I was assuming that this was a reflection off of the throat of the compression driver and that this might go away off axis. A lot of times these types of reflections will even out as you get into off axis areas, but unfortunately that's not what happened. Okay, Nick, go ahead. Fuck! Which meant that I was going to have to cross below this point to make an effective crossover. Since the tweeter barely extends to this point, this was going to make things really complicated. V2X CAD is a free program that's extremely powerful, and we use it for all of our crossover modeling these days. This isn't going to be a full tutorial on how to use V2X CAD. Instead, I'm just going to show you how I set up to start designing my crossovers. So as you can see, I've already loaded in all of my measurement data. 
In this case, I've taken measurements at 10 degree increments off axis horizontally. You can measure in a finer resolution than this. You can do every five degrees if you want, but my experience has been that 10 degrees gives the same picture as five degrees. So I usually stick to 10 degrees just to cut down on the number of measurements I need to make. I also, as long as the cabinet is symmetrical horizontally, I'll only do horizontal in one direction. Now, normally I would do off axis vertical measurements as well, but in this case, the cabinet is symmetrical. So if we load in the woofers as a single unit, we're going to get a really good approximation from V2X CAD. The uh, modeling that it does to approximate off axis angles is very good. The other challenge we would have ran into is that because the cabinet is in three pieces and it's so large and heavy, uh, we were going to need to build a completely new turntable rig to be able to do these measurements. So by measuring the woofers all as a single unit as opposed to individual drivers, uh, we cut the number of measurements down significantly. And because the cabinet and driver layout is symmetrical both horizontally and vertically with a uh, coaxial mid, we're going to get modeling data that, that matches up to what we would actually measure. I've already input the acoustic offsets for the drivers and I'm not gonna go through today exactly how to find those. There are plenty of other guides out there on how to do that and I'll even link to some in the comments. The, the, but those are definitely something that you have to have to be able to start doing modeling. So the way that I like to lay this out is I put all of my drivers in with the acoustic offsets and then I start to load in the data and you can see some of the problems here that we're going to have with the mid as I connect it directly. So that cliff is going to mean that I really need to cross down low. And you can see when I connect the tweeter and pull up the measurements that we barely have enough extension from the tweeter to match up to the mid and cover that area where the mid falls off. So this means it's probably going to be a fairly difficult crossover to do passively. Actively, you've got a lot more flexibility and that's one option. And this build definitely almost made me go active. However, I really like the simplicity of a passive crossover and how easy it is to move my system around if I wanna do that. Uh, if I wanna change rooms, I don't have to deal with thousands of cables and multiple amps. So I always like to start out by creating the shell of a crossover. I usually start with a third order crossover. I've never used more than a third order crossover on a tweeter circuit. Uh, so that's where I usually start. And I like to put a resistor out in front and an L pad behind. And that allows me maximum flexibility uh, since Resistors in different locations sometimes will shape the circuit slightly differently uh, based on how it's interacting with the imp impedance curve. The Sometimes the resistor in one location will tilt the response the top end down a little bit, and sometimes it will tilt the bottom end down depending on where you have those. So generally I'll set the shell up and then I'll start to short or open components until I have a first order crossover to start playing around with that's connected to the tweeter. And then once that's set up, given the response of this driver when you have a really downward sloping response like this which is common from a waveguide or horn loading uh, what you'll generally want to do is use a small capacitor uh, out, out in front so i'm going to start with a small value and see kind of what that looks like so i'm going to start with a small capacitor value like 2.2 microfarads and you can see that tilts the response down nicely however that does cause the peak around three kilohertz to be a little more exaggerated. The other problem is that the crossover point looks like it's around two kilohertz right now. So that's going to leave a gap when we start to add in the mid, since the mid has to be crossed below about 1600 hertz. Now, sometimes going to a higher order crossover, you're able to push the response down a little bit, but make the slope a little steeper, and that can have benefits in multiple areas. So I thought I might be able to get that peak out while also pushing the response down, but no matter what combination of values or crossover slopes I played with, I really couldn't get that to flatten out in the way I wanted. So I had to start doing some new things like adding in notch filters. And I'm just gonna jump ahead here because it took a lot of time to kind of get to this response, but eventually I ended up with this circuit. So in the end, I ended up with a pretty complicated crossover. The tweeter circuit has two notches. The mid ended up being second order on the bottom end and fourth order on the top end with an additional two notches on the mid. And then the woofer is by far the simplest. It's just a straight second order electrical. I know one of the big complaints by people here as they look at this, this graph is going to be the dip at two kilohertz. But what I wanna point out is that by raising this level, we increase the amount of flare in the horizontal polars as well as creating a much bigger bump in the in-room response, uh, which ends up resulting in a more shouty speaker. And this was confirmed in my listening tests. 
when I listened with this area flattened out some, the speaker was a little more forward and a little harsher on uh, certain recordings. One of the things I like to do when I'm looking at a response that's a little more ragged like this is switch to one third octave smoothing. One third octave smoothing is a little closer to what your ear actually hears when you're in room. So this can show you kind of the overall tonal balance of the speaker. And when I switch to one third smoothing, you'll see that everything flattens out quite a bit, which uh, clearly it will because we're smoothing to a, a fairly heavily. But you can see that the as we look at things uh, across the spectrum, it should look fairly balanced. For instance, the power response is almost a textbook 1 dB per octave downward slope, perfectly hugging the line. As I mentioned earlier in the video, I left a space open in the back of the mid-range cabinet so that I could install the crossovers in that location. This is just going to make everything a little easier to wire up in the end since I'm working with three separate cabinets. Once I connect up all the cabinets, I'll be able to wire everything up externally, but this won't really look the cleanest, so I wanted to make something to kind of cover this up. My plan was to make a grill out of MDF, and I wanted to go a little bit fancier than just doing a straight MDF cover in black. So I looked around for some grill material and found something that was meant for doing custom car grills that's made out of aluminum and is uh, powder coated black. And I decided to cut this down and use this for the majority of the grill just using an MDF frame. The frame on this ended up having a compound motor due to the fact that the cabinet already has an angle built into it. Additionally, I needed to put a rabbet on the vertical edges of the back side of the grill. I have a rabbet already built into the mid-range cabinet, and this would allow the grill to seat flush with the rest of the cabinet. I'm also adding an 11.25 degree chamfer to the inside edge of the front face of the frame. This is something that's done in shaker style cabinets a lot of the time, just to help reduce the boxy look of the frame. Now it's time to turn off the finger saving safety features of the saw stop and cut some aluminum. Obviously this isn't ideal, but if you cut aluminum on your saw stop and don't turn this off, you're going to trigger the safety feature. Because the aluminum was so thin, we built a jig for our fence which helps hold the aluminum down as well as keep it from sliding under the fence as we're pushing it through the blade. After I rip a strip down to the proper width, I'm going to start cross cutting these and then start installing them into the frame. The slot I cut in the frames is a little too wide for the grill material that I bought, so the grill slides around a little loose, so I'm adding some gasket material just to keep things snug. This ended up being the perfect thickness to allow it to press fit in and still maintain a snug fit. Now I need to get the frames glued up and masked off for paint. So while I was in the process of getting these grills assembled and painted, I also started voicing the crossover. Now when we voice our crossovers we like to use something called Wago connectors. You can find them in the electrical department at something like Home Depot. They have little clips that crimp directly to the wire, but are reusable. So they work really well for a situation like this. And they come in multiple different sizes, from two inputs to, I think, up to six inputs. And I'll link to some in the comments below. But crossover testing is where I started to run into a number of different issues. Now, when I first got everything hooked up and started testing, everything sounded pretty good. I thought it needed a little tweaking. But I went back a couple days later and everything started to sound a lot different and I couldn't figure out exactly why. I was noticing that everything sounded a little bit brighter than what I remembered and that it was pulling to one side a little bit. So I went back over all of my crossovers and eventually found that somehow one of the mids had become disconnected. So I got that issue figured out. But I was still having a little bit of trouble. It, it still seemed a little bit base light and like I was adding more padding on the tweeter and mid than I was expecting to. Based on my modeling, it looked like I was shelving down the mid and the tweeter by almost 3 dB over the level of the woofer. And I couldn't figure out exactly why that was happening because in the past my measurements have always matched up with my models. So this was a little perplexing to me. I kept going back and remeasuring the speaker and it looked like it was very flat with the crossover in place. But when I looked at the model, it looked like everything was shelved down. And eventually I went back through all of the prototype crossover parts on the floor and found that it was missing the 100 microfarad cap on the woofer. When I put this into the model, I got exactly what I expected. And I ended up talking to Dan about this and telling him what had happened. And he told me that he had taken the caps for something that he needed and forgot to tell me about it. Have you ever been dragged to the sidewalk and being told you pissed blood? What I've been showing in the background while I've been telling the story about my problems with the crossover has been me using our laser cutter software to lay out a crossover and kind of clean this up. And the reason I didn't 3D print these boards is because it was a little bit too big for the 3D printer that we have. 
I still wanted to make these look really clean and professional, so I laid these out onto MDF in a way that would allow me to keep all of the lines straight and keep this really tidy looking. To mount these components to the board, I'm going to use a combination of liquid nails and zip ties, and this will ensure that not only are they stuck there really well, but there's going to be no vibrations. This crossover had a lot of components, and because of all the notches, as well as being a three-way crossover, it had a lot of coils, so it took a lot of care to lay this board out in a way that minimized coil interference while also being able to fit in the space that I needed it to. Those of you with a keen eye might also notice the new gray resistors that have CSS branding on them. Those are a new house brand resistors that are 100% copper throughout. So I've got two problems here. First, I accidentally sized this for our 1.5 millihenry inductor uh, that I grabbed on accident when I was taking measurements instead of our 3.0. Second, if you look at the co coil orientation here, this one was set to lay down and this one was set to lay down. Uh, and that, how close those are together is not gonna work well. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to stand this up. Luckily, this still fits. Uh, standing up here uh, but rather than try to rip all these components off and uh, redo this I didn't notice this until I got uh, most of the way through with the first board so I'm gonna stand this up and we'll just zip tie it down and use the liquid nails again to make sure it stays in place now this is a really complex crossover and it doesn't have the labeling like we send on our crossover boards to customers that have letters that you match up so you have to take a little bit more care when you're doing it in this way. You really have to read the nodes on your crossover schematic to make sure you're connecting everything up correctly. We also recommend that you always twist the wires together to get a good mechanical connection before you start soldering anything. Once the crossover was all assembled, I did an impedance check to make sure that it matched the model. Once I confirmed that it matched, it was time to install the crossovers in the cabinets. I didn't have quite enough space for the magnets and the rabbit that was on the back side of the cabinet. So I picked up some small little black screws to use as something for the magnets to stick to. Now with the grills, I ran into the final Nick Cage moment of my build. When I built the grills, I left about a millimeter of space on each side, and I did a dry fit with these, and they fit just fine before applying the paint. But the combination of the paint and the magnets going into the MDF swelled it just slightly to the point where I couldn't get them to fit anymore. So I had to go back and trim a little hair off of each side of the grill and then repaint them before I could install them. As I wrap this project up, I know there are a lot of questions about whether this build was worth it or whether the results justify the time commitment. And what I'd like to say to that is, again, this wasn't a build for anyone else. As I mentioned in my first video, this build was really for me. I wanted to get back to some of the passion that got me into this hobby in the first place, which was building really cool stuff. And I wanted to try out some new techniques and new things that I hadn't done before, like working with copper. So in the end, it doesn't really matter whether I had the perfect speaker or the perfect measured response. What really matters is that I got the experience that I was looking for out of this. And that's what we're all really chasing in the end anyway. Whether that's a listening experience, a build experience, or some life experience. So with that said, how do they sound? Well pretty damn good. I can crank these up to 11 all day without breaking a sweat, and they sound smooth and balanced on every recording. Because of the symmetrical coax design in this build, you get a really broad soundstage with really pinpoint imaging, and would probably be considered most people's in-game speaker. So now there's nothing left to do but sit back and enjoy the music. <laughs>